A moderate earthquake measuring 5.6 on the Richter scale occurred near Scotts Mills, Oregon, 32 miles south of Portland, and 21 miles northeast of Salem. Over 30 public buildings were damaged, some severely. Damages cost between 25 and 30 million dollars. Fortunately, no serious injuries were reported. One of the buildings damaged was Oregon's state capitol, which was designed by Francis Keeley and dedicated October 1, 1938. After the earthquake, uh, my office provided a response team that was down here to evaluate the building. What we did is what they call a rapid visual uh, inspection to see if there was any items that posed a hazard to the public. The marble around the uh, uh, rotunda area there was, and in the stairwells was loose, and some of these areas were taped off to protect the public from anything that might break loose, either due to an aftershock or if it came loose just from gravity. So all these items were uh, done visually screened, allowed the state legislation, which was in session at the time, to get back in and go to work. As a credit to the facilities manager and, and the structure, in 1989, they hired our firm to do an evaluation, a structural evaluation of the building. So we went through the, the structure, looked at for damage, and related that the building was over 50 years old, and they were interested. They found some minor cracking. They wanted to make sure there wasn't any serious problems. After that evaluation, when the Scotts Mills earthquake occurred, we had a comparison. We were able to compare between what was existing and back in our 89 review versus what happened after the Scotts Mills earthquake and the damage. The damage had increased. We, we, it, was, it was evident. Uh, crack, cracks had enlarged. More cracks had occurred. Clay, the clay tile walls of the rotunda had fractured. The third floor had some fracture damage. The grand staircases had large uh, uh, tears across through them. The Oregon Pioneer statue, he actually completely broke free and rotated up on its pedestal. Uh, it had a complete shear crack all the way around. When the pedestal had fractured, we came back in and decided that we needed to reattach the brick together and the marble. So we epoxy injected the joints and put in some large diameter steel rods to put, basically put everything back into compression. Uh, that was kind of a, a temporary fix at the time. Damage also occurred above the house and senate chambers. There are large steel beams over the, each of the house and senate chambers. A large piece of concrete had fallen off and was laying on one of the wooden platforms, uh, which uh, at that time we felt we needed to provide some sort of uh, mitigation, so we came back in and wrapped some chicken wire around the concrete, and at least for a temporary, again, a temporary fix, trying to keep everything uh, encased. The basic problem with the structure that we're dealing with is that the original building, while being very substantial in terms of vertical loads, that being concrete columns and beams, sufficed to carry the loads as well as the imposed loads of people and furniture. The unfortunate part of that particular construction, and not to fall anyone at the time, but we have only become recently concerned with lateral or seismic disturbances in Oregon and the West Coast, and therefore it was not addressed in the original structure. The infill walls, if you will, between the structural columns and beams was a clay tile wall, which is very soft and withstands very little lateral force. These walls, for the most part, needed to be removed and replaced with a reinforced concrete wall which could tie the beams, columns, and walls together to resist that structural force. And we went to work with the engineers to determine what would have to be done uh, in order to make that building safe for the future. The uh, engineers came back with a proposal that said that for $63 million, uh, they basically could shore the building up, put the isolators in, and make it rel relatively safe uh, in case we had a, a, a more damaging uh, earthquake in the future. Uh, unfortunately, even though I was Speaker of the House that time, I didn't have as much uh, influence as I hoped to because the Ways and Means Committee was not prepared to uh, uh, fund that $63 million package. Uh, instead, they did fund a, a package that was about $4.3 million that dealt with, uh, from my, my perspective, the cosmetics of the rotunda. 
Finally, the committee recommended $4.3 million of other funds, lottery money, to repair earthquake damage to the dome. In total, The first problem for the design team at that point was to identify how much of the existing building could be done within the funding limitation. Obviously there was not enough money to do the entire building. The rotunda and basement area was identified as the first phase to be encountered since this is the tallest unsupported section of the building. That being that the rotunda, some 125 feet in clear span, was more susceptible to damage than are the floors where you have intervening floor structures tied into the structure. This in itself created problems in that the rotunda is a very visible, a historic place and contained some very valuable artwork. So the murals were the first problem to encounter to have them removed, stored, restored, and then repositioned within the rotunda. In doing that exploration, it was discovered that the murals were actually attached to the walls physically with a lead paint adhesive. So this created a new problem for us in terms of abating the lead paint in that particular area for removal. Yeah, so we're very used to working on a large scale, though, you know, 95% of our work is paintings we can pick up and, and uh, carry around ourselves. And that's how most of us are trained, for small works of art, uh, rather than on a scale like this. This is something you really learn on the job and by working with others who have learned on the job. And there are a lot of conservation labs who do mural work, but uh, there are some that specialize in it. And, that's the case with us. They described the project to me and they, and they asked me if I could figure out a way of collecting the mural um, as it was removed from the wall. We tossed several ideas around and finally we, we thought about suspending a tube overhead by a trolley. It was a concern until we finally when we talked to Francis Lombardi who put the uh, scaffold together then we realized that it would be very easy to suspend one. Uh, so that worked out quite well. We uh, included a hoist on the, um, on the trolley to uh, both make small adjustments in the height of the tube to protect the mural and uh, also the ability to lower it to the ground as it was removed. We use a, a wet strength tissue and a Japanese tissue which is adhered to the front with a, a reversible adhesive. And that just holds everything into place while, while the actual canvas is being removed from the walls. We actually had to get down and take the coarse plaster out. The finished plaster and those sections was very thin and very, very hard. Generally, we can cleave the, the finished plaster from the coarse plaster. To be on the safe side, whenever we hit a, a, a spot uh, on the canvas where it was stuck well enough that we were afraid of uh, maybe tearing the canvas, we had to, to go down behind the coarse plaster. Behind the coarse plaster is a ceramic, and that seemed to be the easiest spot to uh, affect the, uh, the cleavage.
appeared originally with a lead white paste, that's lead white, the powder, which is the precipitate of the metal lead, the very lead that was used as the whiting agent in, in house paint that we're so worried about now. That same white powder is mixed with linseed oil and usually a very hard resin, such as damar or mastic, and beat into a very thick, very stiff paste and that was the material used, and they used a lot of it. Mm -hmm. Very firmly, very firmly attached to the walls. But that traditional adhesive has been used for centuries to adhere canvas to walls. The canvas, uh, it's uh, probably, it's a very heavy weight, probably uh, 16 ounce canvas. Uh, it's linen, but it tends to be very rotted in certain spots because the, the oil-rich adhesive has rotted the canvas in places. In fact, uh, the reason why artists prime canvas before they paint on it is to prevent the oil from rotting the linen, the oil medium of the paint. Chiseling is not the greatest control. Uh, as you can see, you know, it's, it's a very crude it's effective, but it's very crude, and we're, we're uh, getting a new tool today that maybe you'll get a chance to see that may give us a much finer control over the removal. Hitting the chisels with a hammer was, was physically very demanding, and, and uh, so when I got back to uh, Minneapolis and to my own shop, I began experimenting with a small air hammer and uh, realized that if I regulated the uh, pressure in front of the uh, air hammer, you could you could make them quite controllable. So I adapted one uh, for uh, their use, converted a couple of chisels uh, at our local hardware store, and uh, shipped them out. Anxiously awaited a, a report to find out if they worked well, and they said they didn't. I think I sent three more out the next day, and they were uh, apparently quite glad to get them. When the project was put together, uh, it was suggested that we use, look at a partnering agreement. And a partnering agreement on a construction project like this is a great idea. And the state and the contractor and the design team all work together to get a project on time, on budget, and the best project can be done. Obviously, we had to start in the basement in Hearing Room 50, which also is a very attractive, architectural treasure for the people of the state of Oregon and needed to be preserved as closely as possible in its original state. If you can imagine, if you will, hearing room 50 is surrounded by mechanical and electrical rooms which service the entire building. All of the walls that were common to this space were then covered with electrical conduits, electrical panels, uh, HVAC control panels, all of those kinds of things which make the building operate. It was determined early in that process that it was economically impossible for us to remove all of that, and therefore those walls were left intact of the clay tile, and they were used as the rear form for what eventually became a reinforced concrete structure. After all the existing finishes in Hearing Room 50 were documented, we started taking them apart and uh, setting them aside in a, in a manner that they would not be disturbed through the construction.
Then we started with the demolition of the existing clay tile walls. Uh, as we got into those walls, as with any uh, restoration project, you find things that aren't exactly as you thought they were going to be. And uh, this was true with the clay tile walls. They didn't always hit underneath the existing beams like they, we thought they were going to. So as those walls came down, we realized that maybe the new structure wasn't going to be able to go back into the exact location shown on the drawings, as was the uh, structural engineer's intent. The team immediately got together and uh, went through all the issues and uh, through the uh, teamwork that uh, was put together at the beginning of the project we were able to work through the issues come up with uh, modifications to the design so that uh, as soon as the demolition was complete the new structural walls would go in without uh, very little impact to the, uh, the progress of the project. Contractor came in it had to drill thousands and thousands of holes in the floors and the beams and the columns and install reinforcing steel. and then he was able to come in and apply a 12-inch thick reinforced concrete wall all around the hearing room, and then was able to finish that. Uh, it didn't have to be finished, a trowel finish, but just a very, a very rough finish. The design that was used uh, was a what we call a shear wall. It is a concrete wall, a thick wall. It uh, goes all the way up to the underside of the existing dome, and then the dome itself was reinforced with concrete. Uh, brick was removed and concrete was put in place of the brick, um, both for weight and for appearance. The shear walls themselves are on all four sides of the rotunda area. The intent is that when the earthquake comes, the design earthquake that uh, the geologists tell us will come, the load from the rest of the building will go into these walls and the load the energy comes out of the ground, into the building, the building shakes, when it shakes, it parts the energy into these walls, and these walls either dissipate or take the energy back down to the ground. In hearing room 50, if you walk in there right now, you'll never know we were there, and that's kind of what became our motto in the office. And that's, uh, yeah, I don't want anybody to know that I ever did any work in that room. We have anywhere from 12 to 18 inches of reinforced concrete behind those hearing room walls. And uh, they, they cut across and they provide a stiff foundation uh, for our shear walls and for our system. As we moved into the next stage of the project, which was up here in the rotunda, uh, again the first thing that we did was catalog the finishes and tagging each piece of marble so that when we got around to putting the finishes back in, it would all go in in the exact same location it was before we took it out.
Once the marble was uh, stored, we started the demolition here in the rotunda. Uh, again, the, the uh, structural frame, the concrete structural frame of the building was infilled with the clay tile walls that were non-structural and uh, they came out very easily because there just was not any strength to them and that's what uh, shook during the earthquake and uh, that's what caused the cracking of the plaster. The other thing that the Capitol people had to wrestle with was the restoration of the interior space to original colors and finishes. An extensive uh, finding, if you will, had to be undertaken, and this was done by Al Staley, architectural consultant from Portland, who went through a lot of research in, in old photographs, the talking to people who had been around for a while and eventually doing actual scrapings on the walls themselves to determine the number and colors of layers of paint to arrive at what was eventually re-finished within the space to get as close as possible to the original colors and restoration. The original design intent in the upper dome was to uh, remove eight inches of the existing brick, uh, drill stainless steel anchors through the remaining brick into the exterior marble panels. Then install a layer of rebar and then eight inches of gunite, which would take it back to the original finished dimensions. What we found was in our preliminary investigation the existing walls were actually narrower than originally thought and there was an asbestos coating on the existing brick that was very cost prohibitive to try to remove. The team met and through working through several different ideas the structural engineer agreed that we could leave the existing brick in place drill our anchors in through the existing brick into the marble, install two layers of rebar, and then install six inches of new gunite. Uh, this process was done in a manner that, uh, through the teamwork, that did not really impact the schedule of the project. There's really two domes in the building and the upper area. There's the outer dome, which you see is the marble and the brick and the concrete that we've added. And then there's the inner dome, which is a stucco uh, dome suspended 
from the outer dome, uh, which we tied together. If you look up and see the windows, there's actually a catwalk at the bottom of those windows. The two domes were working independent. Due to the new seismic requirements, we have tied them together to make them work together. The original intent of the work in the observation deck was to remove the existing paver tile and replace those once the, the work was done. Also, to remove and replace the existing flashing and remove eight inches of the existing brick and replace that with gunite. What actually happened was, once we saw the condition of the existing brick pavers, we brought that an idea to the team to replace those with brand new pavers at no cost to the state. The state agreed to that and we put those pavers on order. Now knowing that we would replace the existing pavers with new, uh, we kind of changed the design a little bit in which we did not take out the full bed of the existing pavers. All we did was remove the existing pavers, put in new area drains, and then put a new bed for the new pavers on top of the old. Uh, the existing copper pan up there never leaked, uh, except for around the existing area drains, which were replaced. On the exterior wall, we removed the existing flashing. Uh, this flashing was to be reinstalled. It was part of the original flashing that was installed when the building was new in 1938. What we discovered was this flashing was in very poor shape. Many holes had been punched in it, uh, it had been weathered. Uh, it just wasn't in a good watertight condition. Uh, the state chose to install new turn-coated stainless steel flashing, the turn-coated being a zinc-coated stainless steel flashing. Once that flashing, the original flashing was taken off, we removed eight inches of the existing brick parapet wall. Uh, again, we drilled dowels through the brick into the existing marble panels. Those were stainless steel bolts set in epoxy. Then a rebar cage was put in place, and then the eight inches of gunite was placed up against that existing wall, uh, and then brought that out to a, a, the finished dimension. Then the new flashing was installed, the pavers installed, and that completed the process. During our seismic retrofit, we were able to remove the large diameter stainless steel bolts that we had installed after the Scotts Mills earthquake, replace those with a reinforced pneumatically placed concrete wall, tied the brick together with the marble, and then was were able to reattach the Oregon Pioneer uh, to these reinforced concrete walls, something that originally had been omitted from the original 1937 drawings, provided a positive attachment. The mural frames, we designed a steel frame system to isolate the mural frames from the rest of the building. We felt that they needed an extra added factor of safety for protection. They, the, the steel frames are, are mounted on little isolation cups, so in, in the event of an earthquake, the murals are free to move um, by themselves and provide some extra shock absorbers uh, to the mural frame.
back in Minneapolis in the lab, we removed the remaining lead white adhesive and we removed approximately um, 400 pounds of, of lead from the backs of these eight medallions and four murals. And it all had to be done by hand. Uh, many conservators have tried other ways of removing the lead, different types of power equipment, and, but uh, the simple fact remains that the canvas is much softer than the lead. You can damage it real easily and you need to use tools that you can control better and hand tools are always seem to be the things that uh, work the best. There was some delamination of paint in the removal uh, process, but we had a facing holding all the paint in place. We were able to consolidate, that is, re-adhere any loose flakes of paint. And uh, at sites where, some of the sites where there were tears, uh, there was naturally, there were paint loss. And uh, what we did is we filled those areas of loss and uh, with a vinyl filling material that we toned to fairly closely match the original and then afterwards with acrylic paints we went back and in-painted those areas to more perfectly match the original colors. We're now just in the process of coating the walls and the backs of the canvases with a thermoplastic adhesive for uh, reattaching uh, the murals in their original positions on the wall. Adhesive is a, a ethylene vinyl acetate and uh, it is activated at about 160 degrees and uh, we have designed some special platinums for uh, raising the temperature and activating the adhesive using a thin uh, 32 inch silicone uh, pad that's embedded with uh, copper wire and uh, heats up based on resistance. The pads that we've designed not, over, not only heat a larger surface area, but they are safer to use. Uh, there, there's there's uh, very little chance that the surface could be overheated. Uh, uh, obviously, we want to avoid that. And plus, the silicone is very soft and it conforms to the impasto of the paint. Now, in the case of the medallions, uh, because of the difficulty of moving the large tower and the, and the logistics of moving all of these uh, uh, scaffolds, uh, rather than using the ethylene vinyl acetate adhesive, uh, rolling it on the wall where it takes uh, about eight hours to dry before we can put another coat on, we're using a different uh, form of the adhesive. It, it, it's a film and it's uh, sandwiched between a couple of pieces of silicone. And uh, we remove one, one uh, we have cut the, the adhesive film to the same dimensions as the medallions and uh, we attach, we then attach uh, the film to the wall rather than rolling the, the adhesive on. And the film doesn't need to dry, so we thus have saved ourselves a couple of steps. The reason we're not using it on the larger murals is it's fairly time consuming to apply the film and it also is much more costly in that form. 
but with the smaller medallions, which are only about five and a half by five and a half feet, it, it, it's very useful. The last part of this project is returning the decorative element above the four large central panels. Uh, if you look closely going up the stairs, there are stencils, well, they're sort of half painted, half stencil decoration above the four occupation murals. These extend around the wall and above the historical murals. And we will be reproducing those. They were destroyed, of course in the uh, seismic retrofit. We'll do this by placing a glaze down on the wall. Uh, this will give a slightly glossier background uh, to the, a band above the murals, and you can see that in the occupation murals. Then eight little decorative motifs will be placed very, in a very particular manner above each of the large murals. We view this project as a very, very successful project. And the partnering process was a very major key in making this a successful project. We bid this project on a very aggressive schedule, a uh, nine month time frame, and we expected to meet that time frame. And the only way we could do it is with the team working together to address those unknowns and each, in, each issue as it came to light. This was a great project. The whole te design team worked well together. We had a great contractor. The state of Oregon was fantastic in, in working together with us for solving anything that, that might arise. A very smooth, well-running project. Uh, this, any citizen in Oregon should, should be able to come down to this building and look at inside the rotunda and see just the quality of the workmanship that was done. Uh, the only thing other to remember is that this is only a partial retrofit. We have five phases. This is only the first phase has been completed. And the rest of the building is still requires seismic retrofit. We've only uh, basically worked on one part of the structure.